Good morning. It is Wednesday, April 15th. We are here live. Um, I'm Dan Blewett. This is the Morning Rushback Podcast. I'm joined here by my co-host, Bobby Stevens. Bobby, how are you? Happy tax day. Robert, Robert, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear. I said happy tax day. But if you don't want, if you want to mute me, it's cool. here. And I'm joined also by Liam Bowen. I'm, I think, having audio issues. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I hear you great, Dan. Yeah. And uh, Liam Bowen is the head coach of UMBC Baseball. And UMBC is uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, obviously. Liam, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Well, Dan's having, Dan's having issues. I want to lead off with my, uh, my late night poll on Twitter. Uh, so Liam, this is a question I've actually asked this question before in a dugout and I feel like I got a lot more, um, a lot more one-sided response, but would you rather have a, a September call up, win the world series, be the world series MVP, but you never get to play in the big leagues again, or have a six year career in the big leagues. You're an everyday starter, but you never make the playoffs and you're never an all-star. Well, both of those are a little hard for me to imagine since I didn't play a day of pro ball, uh, Bobby. So it's a, it, it, it would all be a dream for me. But um, it, I guess if, it, if, if, if you're ever kind of breaking down team success versus kind of individual consistency and rewards, like I would always kind of default to team success. I think being a part of the best baseball team on earth would be more rewarding than, than just about anything. You know, I, th I think that that kind of group connection and success and the bond you would have with those guys and, and that city, I think that would out, outweigh the rest of it for me. Dan, what, what about you? What do you got? Man, I just like I certainly appreciate that answer. I just wanted to learn more about like the thing that I missed the most when I was forced into retirement by my revolting body was. <laughs> <laughs> that I like I came back every year my last bunch of years just learning all these nuanced high level things that you kind of like don't know are going on you know stuff from my teammates things that my teammates do things my opponents do just new things you learn every year and I really treasured that so I I would take the six years of mediocrity which mediocrity on the world's highest level is not mediocrity obviously but I would take that I just I just loved kind of getting all the nooks and crannies of the the highest the highest levels that I played at. And obviously there are a lot higher levels above me too. It's a tough one for me. I, I kind of side with, you know, uh, being the legend, you know, the, the world series MVP. I've heard they never die. So I they mean, never that. die. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the, the texts I've been getting on the side had been, I'm taking the money, you know, six years, you get, you're going to bank a few million dollars at least uh, probably looking at, especially in your arbitration years, if you're decent enough, you're going to get some money, but the amount of free meals I'm going to get in that town, especially if we're talking like, <laughs> like if it's, if I was the, the Cubs MVP in 2016, like I'm not yeah. paying for another meal in Chicago. That might be different if I was like the, I don't know, there's really no small towns in the big leagues, but if I was like the Kansas city Royals MVP, and then I never moved back there and nobody cares about me because Kansas city's got, couple hundred thousand people but man if i'm like a mets if i'm the mets world series mvp and i'm walking around manhattan i'm a i got a statue does anyone care about the mets in new york Correct i don't me know if I'm wrong somebody's here. got there's got to be maybe one small person. there's got to be like a small group of restaurant tours and like queens that really like the mets i could get a free beer every once in a while mm -mm -mm. Liam, so I got a couple of lightning round questions. Uh, All right. It's, it's early. First one, what have you or your wife or your kids bought to improve your sanity during quarantine? Is there any like item that sticks out that you're like, this is great. I need this. I got this and I'm happier. You know, what's been cool is I actually introduced my kids to baseball cards. They're I have two little girls. They're six and three. And evidently, I did not know this before the quarantine, but you can find old packs of cards from like the early nineties on Amazon that I think they've like resealed up and they're not very expensive. And we open a pack every day or so. And, you know, the, the older girls figuring out the stats on the back, the younger girl just likes the pictures. Um, <laughs> it's pretty cool. No, that, that, that's probably been my favorite thing we've done so far in the quarantine. There you go, Bobby. What, what, 
you have any I've, new things this week? No, nothing this week. I've been I've been podcast central. I think I've got a like yeah. Dan Dan likes to joke. I think I've got a my a hold on my credit card for my wife after all this uh the lighting and the the Bobby has an, he has an he has an allowance. He wants to be mayor of Chicago, but he's not mayor of his own home. I mean, I'm sure there's <laughs> a lot of married men out there can appreciate that, but you know, I I just I I rib Mr. Stevens. My new thing is you can probably see our fourth guest here on the show is this actual real plant. I have my first real plant and it's in frame. So you at home get a little little uh forestry a little shrubbage or whatever you want to call yeah, it Some yeah, fo- liam's, foliage. foliage liam's raising two girls and, and you've got a fern in the background <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, uh, you guys have me beat on the uh, the podcast studio uh, deal in your home i'm i'm here in the playroom so um you might be able to to see a stray toy in the background here uh, but dan you look good there man I, I like the uh you know the greenery you got it's a uh, futuristic studio apartment setting right now. That's what we got here. And my uh, these are these little tiles behind me are uh, half art and half um, sound dampening tile thingies. So yeah, a lot going on here in my 400 square feet or so up in in DC. Um, second question, Liam: How are you handling? Like, are you doing anything for your baseball fix? Are you watching 1970s Orioles broadcasts on Periscope? Like, what are you what are you doing to, for your baseball fix besides baseball cards? Which is a great answer, by the way. Baseball cards were super fun as a kid. Oh, I loved them. Yeah, I, I wasn't like a big um, collector in terms of you know I didn't have like a Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card or anything, but I loved uh, going to the the drugstore and getting them and you know uh, you know seeing who I got in that pack. But as far as a baseball fix, like you know we're we're really still still chugging along, even though we're not playing games. I mean, we needed to finish our recruiting class with a couple uh, junior college players that we just recently uh, got commitments from. Um, we're doing a ton of long range planning. I mean, I think in in, in my years in Division One baseball, studying successful mid major programs, I think um, a, a real clarity of vision is common to the best ones, and that's what we're trying to create at our place. So that's taken some time and work, but that's been enjoyable the honest truth is dan that like i get enough baseball doing what i do with umbc like i'm not a a guy it would probably surprise some people i'm not a guy who like goes home and watches mlb games like i i come home five yeah we're the same we're the same people (laughs) people think it's weird but yeah i don't know i am so there's a girl i know and she might be listening but she works for the irs i'm like do you go home and do taxes when you're done work for the day she's like but it's sports it's different i'm like i get my fill like during the day so you going to get your fill to an extent no doubt and and I've, I've tried to explain this to people and i wonder if i'm articulate enough but like um like i i'm the furthest thing from from burnout on on baseball like i love what i do for umbc it's a phenomenal um joy and privilege to to be the head coach here and, and i love waking up and and working on our program, even during the quarantine where I don't, I'm not able to do some of the things that are typical this time of year, but uh, like, I, I find baseball so interesting and such a, such a rich subject to work with, but I, I kind of, from a personal standpoint, I kind of got over like the, the crack of the bat and the roar of the crowd a long time ago. You know, it's, it's more something that um, I work on and is a platform for me to have like these relationships and the, the piece of, um, you know, each of our guys' lives that, that I get to have, it's not really so much about like just loving baseball for baseball's sake at this point. I guess that makes sense. Bobby, what about you? Do you have a, a baseball fix, any kind of thing going on right now? I do. You know what? I, every, I have a youth, the youth program that I run, um, I post daily workouts and it's, it's become like a, almost like a little bit of a challenge to, to give them something to do every day. So it's, it's not just physical. It's a, uh, you know, watch 20 minutes of baseball highlights, you know, look up your favorite player and watch highlights of him playing defense. Uh, that's pretty much my fix. Just kind of brainstorming there. I've never been a guy probably similar to both of you that has gone and just watched ESPN highlights like and watched YouTube videos. I just don't do it. Um, it's almost like a, a nice welcome break a little bit from baseball without feeling guilty because I do make a, you know, to dedicate most of my time to baseball. So it's nice to just kind of back away and not have to think about baseball and not feel guilty for not seeing the, you know, what, what the latest MLB uh, controversy might be or what have you. 
Yeah. So if you're just tuning in, we're here with Liam Bowen. He's the head coach of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. They're a Division One school, obviously in Maryland, located in Baltimore County. Also, my alma mater, which um, I'm extremely proud. Of. I mean, Liam, I'm I'm very proud of what you've been doing with the program. You know, you're new at the helm, only just a couple of years now, and uh, you know, I've seen a lot of really good changes. Um, and I had a great experience at UMBC as a as a player. I really appreciate my coaches from from my day. Um, Liam was not my head coach. You were a couple years. When did you, when did you join the program? So I became the pitching coach for the 2012 season, and then okay. I became the head coach this past summer. So I've officially been the head coach for about nine months. Gotcha, gotcha. So with all of that, um, we want to have him on the show because he's got a really, I feel like, fair and balanced mindset with pitching, with recruiting. Like you said, you've already heard a little a glimpse, I think, into it already with his view on whether he'd rather be on a great team or great individually, you know, and his obviously like, I think your answer is very astute as far as the relationships are ultimately what, what you take home from, from sports. Right. Oh, for sure. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, I had a boss in division two um, right before I got to UMBC, still the head coach of Lincoln Memorial university, Jeff six, I great coach. And I, I remember something he told me and he said, in, in our line of work, part of your salary is the way you're involved in your players' lives. And you have to look at it that way, you know, because I think particularly as, as you're trying to break in to coaching, I'm certainly not complaining about the way I'm treated at UMBC, but like as you're trying to work your way up in coaching, I think we all know it's not the most lucrative thing, you know, a person in their 20s can do. Um, our players at UMBC who don't go into pro balls are certainly making a lot more money than I was when I was, you know, 24, 25. So it, you have to really buy into the idea that like the relationship piece is really valuable and, and, and really irreplaceable. So I've always that, you know, what six told me back then stuck with me and I've always really believed it. Yeah. And, um, I was listening, I was, uh, uh, putting out a APB to come to our show on, on Instagram while you're talking, I have to take my little quick moments to interact with. Oh, our, no, you're good, man. Chat. You're so good. if you're out there on uh, Twitter or on YouTube, the live chat's open, we're monitoring it. So if you've got, if you want to troll us and leave us a really rude comment, feel free. Lines are open. <laughs> I'm going to leave a really positive comment. Um, lines are open. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking back, like I think with each year that passes and Bobby, I'll be curious if you have the same experience. Like, I forget more and more of like the actual baseball moments and like the stats stuff, like they become foggier, but like the really fun times with teammates and um, lessons I learned from coaches and other players, those are the things that really just continue to stand out and like become more, more vivid almost over time. Yeah, no doubt. And I, you know, I jumped in, I jumped on the, on the zoom late and you guys were talking and, um, is something that Liam said hit kind of hit home about attending weddings. Like, tra you know, like I'm a travel coach. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really expect to be invited to some of the 18 you guys weddings in five, six, whatever many years. But from my experience, I, I invited three of my five college coaches to my wedding. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in touch with all five of those guys, but via, via Twitter uh, for all of them and text messages on the side. I just saw my old, uh, the guy that recruited me, the assistant coach, he's at Lewis University. I saw him a couple weeks ago. I went down there just to talk hitting and, you know, kind of BS with the with the coaching staff. And my former head coach uh, moved back to the college that he came from. Um, so North Central College in, in Naperville, Illinois. He went to, you know, he went to Division One, then went back to Division Three. Um, I don't want to say like the twilight of his career because he's really successful and they're a top 10 program. But I talked to him every, daily you know, mm -hmm. through Twitter and text message. So I remember all that stuff. I, I could maybe remember a handful of games from college, but I remember, you know, the relationships and the people you meet much, much more, and it's more impactful. So let's talk about Twitter for a minute. And I, I, we're going to have a lot of Twitter stuff next week with uh, Jeff Fry, who's a former major leaguer, very active um, on, on Twitter right now on the hitting side. We, we talked a little bit off camera about, how do people use Twitter and Twitter, I think is probably like the most thriving coaching environment right now. And I think all of us have expressed sort of the same sentiment where we're not really sure how to do it and be authentic. And one thing I notice is a lot of, if you look at Twitter, it's not as much a kid, not like kids, kids, but like 
16 year old kids are on Instagram. They're not on Facebook. They're not on Twitter as much. There's like a small carryover to Twitter for actual ball players. And one thing that, that confuses me a lot, I see a lot of coaches and some like really popular Twitter coaches, or like I'm one of those like online sort of coaches, um, posting stuff and it just gets retweeted. And it seems like it's directed just at coaches. Like it's one of those tweets about character and about doing this and about doing that. And I'm like, and I wonder if the end user, like the kid who you're saying, like, these are good character traits, like hustle more down to first base and stuff. Um, and then like other coaches retweeted. I'm like, was that for other coaches to retweet or was it for actually like for a player? And I know Bobby, you're kind of outspoken about this stuff, but like, how do you feel like this is a question to you first, Liam, but like, you're not on Twitter very much and the at all the, actually but. At, at, at all <laughs> but maybe maybe you lurk every now and again um there's a lot of good information on the web there's a lot of good information shared on twitter um it also is a place where you can get out your pointy sticks and and throw them throw them at each other um how do you feel like we we can do this well going forward and and what do you do if anything as far as your continuing education whether it's social media or beyond well, I do a ton with the continuing education. There's a ton of stuff out there that you can learn. I've definitely, like, I definitely go through Twitter and, and every once in a while and maybe try and pick up some things up. Um, truthfully, I'm, I'm mostly directed there by our assistant coaches. You know, they're a little bit more active uh, than I am, and they do a really good job of kind of curating it for me and sending me good stuff. Um, I, I guess the, the way to do it well, it, to me, seems like the way to do anything well, and that's uh, to, to make sure that every time, you know, we're, we're communicating, we're doing, we're doing it for uh, what, what I would consider a, a legitimate and, and noble reason, which is anything but just trying to attract af affirmation to ourselves. And that's why I've always um, just not, not been an enthusiastic uh, uh, Twitter user or social media user is I just think to get to the things that are really valuable, which there totally are. Like, I know you've put great content out there that I've read in the past and they're there are many other guys doing the same thing. Uh, you have to sit, sift through a lot of um, what I would consider, if I'm being really frank, like some, some affirmation seeking stuff. And I just, that, you know, to me that, um, that that's just not the way that I want to personally spend my time. Yeah. Bobby, what about you? You're the, you're the most <laughs> outspoken Twitter person I know, but without going on your soapbox and getting like too far off down the rabbit hole, what do you feel like people can do better? To, what could we all do if we make a Twitter utopia or internet utopia? Uh, I, my viewpoint is it's, it's gotten very preachy. It's gotten very, you know, it feels very self-serving instead of serving the community. Um, you know, the, I like Twitter because it gives you access to everybody that you wouldn't normally have access to. And I like for my, high school guys to have a Twitter because a lot of recruiting is done on a Twitter nowadays. And, you know, for like Liam, Liam, you said, you're not on, you're not personally on Twitter, but your assistants are, and I'm sure, sure they're following. Uh, I would assume at least they're probably following a few of these guys that retweet uh, prep players or junior college players, you know, because there's a lot of information that gets spread very quickly on Twitter. Um, so I don't like, the whole the whole self-promoting aspect where it feels inauthentic and it feels like a uh a look at me type platform but i do like how much access and how fluid it could help potential youth players get to the next level for baseball and i don't you know a lot of times those paths will cross and it's and if you're a younger player or someone or an, or an adult who's trying to learn a little bit about baseball that gets muddied and you don't know who to believe. And everyone's got the same platform essentially, which makes it frustrating as somebody who's in baseball to see misinformation spread or something I think is, you know, not beneficial to whoever the, you know, whoever the target audience is, but I do see a lot of the benefit in the Twitter recruiting and the, you know, a way to promote yourself, especially for some kids who may not have the financial means to get to some of these big showcases or some of the, some of the high profile, you know, events that a lot of coaches have been using to find players. Yeah, Bobby, I think you kind of um, got to divide it into two pieces. And the first of the recruiting piece where, where, where you're exactly right. I mean, we recently got a 
commitment from a junior college player where the first place we saw him was on Twitter, you know, where, where uh, somebody put a video up, the video eventually got to me um, and we got things um, kind of rolling. One thing led to another and he, he's committed to our school. He'll be here in the fall. and We're really excited about him. So that's a real thing. Like, like even somebody like me, who's not like a, um, a, a true social media, um, you know, believer and somebody who does a lot with it. Like I, I definitely see the value there. Um, but the, the, I would say the, the thing um, that I think we all have to be wary of and that I have to be wary of, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to preach. Like I have all this figured out myself is I think it, it can be a little bit of an echo chamber where it becomes a deal where it, if you're coaching guys a certain way, like a, a way that I would say is, um, you know, maybe analytics friendly and, and um, uh, you know, heavy on biomechanics, which is all stuff I believe in, then you, you know, I think, as a coaching community, we can create an echo chamber that gets us away from results because the way I see it, you can be great on the biomechanics. If, if you're not winning games, then you know, there are adjustments that need to be made because at the end of the day, it, it's, it's W's and L's it's yes or no. And right now we don't, we're not winning enough. We need to get better, you know, and, and that's no matter what, what we're doing well um, from a, from a development standpoint, we need to continue to push and, and continue to grow because you know, even if, if we're getting a lot of affirmation because of the way that we're coaching guys, because it's perceived as the right way, if it's, if it's not winning us games, we need to continue to, um, to chip away at that. So that, that, I think it's kind of operating in two lanes. There's, there's, a, there's a useful quality to it, but then there's an echo chamber quality to it where I think you can, um, you can end up sort of believing your own hype and, and not valuing winning enough. Yeah, yeah. I really like that, uh, that breakdown. And that I want to stay on the recruiting for a second because sure. it's, uh, I do work with a lot of youth guys, so I know that a lot of them watch this. You know, as a recruiting coordinator, now you're the head coach, but you know, you you were the recruiting coordinator, and and it, from my experience, recruiting guys love to recruit, uh, so I'm sure it's in you. How would you prefer, you know, youth players get in touch with you or get themselves in front of you? Because there's so many ways and so many outlets, uh, you know, with the showcases, the tournament teams, the you know, just posting your videos, you've got the, the recruiting online profiles, you know, what's the best way in your opinion to, to approach a coach of a school you're interested in and, you know, make it feel like you're, you know, I'm Bobby Stevens, 17 year old player. And I really want to go to UMBC and I don't want to make it, you know, I don't want to blast out a hundred emails. I'll kind of want to see if it, there's any interest there. You know, how would you prefer guys to get in front of you? Or is there a, is it just send in an email and you kind of put them on your watch list? That's a good question. Yeah, I, I, a really good question. I think, you know, direct, unique contact is always good. So a guy who emails us who it's clear that it's not a mass email, it's clear that it's not written by their parents. There's a true investment of time in contacting UMBC on the player's part. That's always really good um, for that email to be valuable it has to have video and it has to have some sort of objective measurement within the video so if a guy's throwing a bullpen a radar gun is good if a guy is you know um, running down the line um, you know getting the the whole runtime in the frame where we can put the watch on it is positive and then it has to have some description of the guy's track record and th th this cannot be overemphasized like if it's a high school guy or really if it's a junior college guy too they have to be a dominant player at that level and if they're not a dominant player at that level, the time that they've spent contacting me, in my opinion, that time should be invested in a guy like yourself, Bobby, trying to get better and continue to develop so that they can really do a great job for their, their high school or their junior college program. And I think sometimes we can get the cart ahead of the horse where, um, you know, and it happens at our level too, guys are thinking about the, the professional level and says, hey, wait a second, let's try and dominate the America East. You know, you know we want to take things, uh, you know, one at a time and, and make sure that we're, we're keeping development and, and exposure in the right balance. So I, I will tell you this, Bobby, if a guy gets in contact with us and it's clear that he's really interested in our school, the video's good. He's a good student. He's a dominant high school baseball player. I'll find a way to see that guy. And if for whatever reason uh, we, we can't see that guy, we'll absolutely invite him to camp. And if he lights us up at camp, he'll end up being on our team or at least get an offer from us. Yeah. And Dan, I don't want, I know you got something that I just want to jump in. One more thing too, is, you know, a lot of parents will ask me, you know, have you talked to anybody or, you know, have you reached out to any schools? You know, how much 
would you prefer to hear from just the player and how much would you prefer to hear from a high school coach or say a travel coordinator um, just in your, you know, how much stock do you take in that? I know, you know, in a, in the coaching community, any college coach I've talked to has always been very receptive to someone um, if I've, you know, recommended them or, or basically said, you know, Hey, this, I think this could be a really good fit and he's got the measurable numbers to play at your level, but w- how much contact do you prefer to have with just the player himself and how much do you like to be referred to, um, especially from someone you may not have a, a personal rapport with? I, we'll always listen to recommendations. I mean, I think getting information from people who are around the player every day is really valuable. You know, I, I think that can't really be replaced. So at some point in the process, we're going to hear from the coaches and, and I, you know, we definitely put a lot of stock in that. At some point, the player's got to be involved you know, uh, more so than the coaches, though. I think the coaches have their place. You know, that's a conversation or two, but you want to move it forward with the player. And and occasionally it'll get, it'll, it'll become a situation where you almost feel like the coach is more excited about the player coming to our school than the player is that that's what you want to stay away from. But, you know, we get to see a guy play a a handful of games. Um, If you're with a guy every day, you know, trying to train them, develop them, coach him, you know, we, we need to hear from you and we need to get that perspective. No question. Yeah. So we got two really good questions from YouTube. Um, Kevin Latham and Kevin Kozlowski. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Number one um, for a little more on junior college. So sure. I know, I know Kevin, I know you, Kevin. What's up? Um, <laughs> so Kevin has a son, John, great kid, like fantastic human, love him to death. Um, he's a junior college player. So they like the whole high school recruiting thing is its own animal. Can you talk more into like, what does a junior college kid have to do to get seen? I mean, that seems like it's a little bit harder because he's with his team. D1 teams are playing at the same time, obviously. So can you speak a little bit more on what a junior college kid has to do to get, to get seen and and move on? Uh, It's, it's really the, the two biggest things are be a dominant player at the junior college level, be it, be a guy who's deciding, games uh, for your junior college program and then make sure that you're making good progress in the classroom and a lot of that uh, in a lot of cases is on the player himself he's got to understand the NCAA rules he's got to understand what kind of classes transfer to the schools that he'd like to go to Uh, I think there's a misconception out there that if you just stay eligible for your junior college team you'll be eligible for a division one team that's not the case Um, so you have to be a guy who really takes that opportunity seriously. And I love recruiting junior college guys. We, we've recruited a number of them over the years that they've been some really good players for us. Um, we're going to recruit a, a lot more going forward. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a real staple for us. And I just enjoy it because I think it's, it's kind of the land of opportunity in college baseball. You know, there are no juniors and seniors to get um, a little bit more of a runway to get out there and play and test yourself. And, you have to go to school every day and get it done and nobody's going to hold your hand. You know, like if if a kid moves away for junior college, he doesn't have his folks getting him out of bed in the morning and getting him to class. He's got to show that kind of discipline and initiative. So the guys who get through that and and show value for that experience, they're usually the kind of guys you want. So then do they contact you? I mean, they, do they just need to send you an email? Obviously there's no, some of the other resources like prep baseball reports, some of these, like those don't really exist. So mm-hmm. do they just need to email you directly. It's the same thing. Like try to get, um, I mean, how much is the junior college coach involved? Do they need to send you video? Like where, where does that come from? Especially it's like, say, say a school you've never heard of, like a junior college in, in, in the middle of the Midwest, wink, wink. Mm-hmm. Um, just, mm-hmm. is this an email coming from the kid or how do you find some of these guys? Well, Number one, I would promise you I've heard of that junior college, whatever it is. Like if, if, it, if it's a junior college that plays baseball in the United States, I promise you that I've heard of it. Uh, Danville. And, <laughs> oh, for, yeah, yeah, for sure. The, um, the, I, I think I've actually seen them play. But the, I, I think the, the D1 recruiting coordinator's level of familiarity with junior college baseball, I think, would surprise some people at the junior college level. I think that's, that's part and parcel of the job is my point. I'm not saying that to – to pump my own tires. I think anybody doing this work is going to be really familiar with that level. And then uh, I would say the junior college coach is pretty involved. So, you know, we have a database um, of the email address for every junior college coach in the country. I used to have to call uh, all these junior college coaches when I was a a young assistant. Now a little bit more of it's on email as people have gotten more comfortable with that, but uh, we'll blast out an email to the, to the whole country. And we'll say, Hey, look, we need a, um, 
we need a left-handed pitcher. You know, we're looking for more of a pitchability guy. We don't need like an arm strength, you know, project type of guy. Somebody who can come in and, and help us. And, you know, guys will fire back recommendations. And, you know, it's, it's not uh, uncommon to get 50, 60 recommendations that the recruiting coordinator and I would sift through. We'd look at video. We'd look at transcripts. We'd look at, um, you know, the guy's statistical track record. And we start figuring out, you know, who's going to be our priority in terms of going to see or, or getting in contact with. So, um, okay. Well, good segue into uh, the other question. So how much um, does showcase, or do you, in your opinion, has showcase culture hurt players as far as like the team culture goes and how necessary are showcases? I mean, is, is dominating your high school season and dominating summer ball? Is that enough? I think it, I would say being a, a dominant player isn't necessarily enough. You have to add a little bit more to that. And, and the piece you, you would have to add is some initiative in the recruiting process. Like, like I always compare it to um, the, uh, and, and, and this is not going to be um, something that the player himself can, um, can understand because he hasn't done this, but the parents should be able to. It's, it's kind of like any big purchase. If you're buying a house, if you're buying a car, anything like that, like, I actually just bought a car about six months ago. I didn't wander into the dealership and say, Hey, look, I'm, I'm looking for anything that drives just like, what are my options? It's like, no, yeah. no you know, it's like, I got to fit the car seats in it. It's got to be good on gas. You know, I had some, it's got to be in a certain mm -hmm. price. You know, I didn't, I didn't buy a Porsche uh, guys. Um, like it's it, there, you got to have some parameters going in and you got to kind of understand the market and understand what's out there. So if you do that and you're a heck of a player, and you know what you want from the recruiting process, whether it's a certain kind of degree, a certain level of academic reputation, play at a certain conference, whatever it might be. Um, you either get in front of those coaches through showcase baseball or, like I said before, you go to the, the camp and you, and you rip it up at camp. And, you know, I, I think, I, I, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time, so I really don't think I'm naive about this. But if a guy is a truly, um, uh, you know, legitimate and, and worthy player, I think the process is going to find him more often than not, as long as he shows some initiative in terms of knowing where he wants to end up. Yeah. And I think sometimes I think there's two sizes. Cause I know for me as a high school senior, I thought I was super good and I apparently wasn't. And I looked around, I'm like, where are all the scouts that I hear so much about? And they weren't there because I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had gone back in time and, sent lots of emails to schools that kind of fit my ability. Like if I knew now, you know, if I could assess my ability from today, you know, 15 years ago, um, you know, I would have still gotten people to come to my games. I would have gotten people to come look at me because I wasn't a bad player. I just threw like 80 at a time where 80 was a lot better than it is now. Mm -hmm. And I like, had, I had some ability, so like that, but just like teams weren't going to just float out of the ether to come. Like people weren't talking about me, right? If you, if back then, if you're throwing 88, you know, one guy like me at a game, one guy like Bobby at a game, if you just like happen to see a guy, suddenly you tell someone who tells someone who tells someone who tells someone, tell someone, everyone knows about that player in the area, right? So um, those skills matter. But I think another thing that he's kind of getting at is how much weight do you put into statistics? So if, you know, a guy says, hey, here's my son, you know, maybe he, he doesn't strike you as like jumping out. Of, he's not six five or he's not doesn't jump out with a physical tool right away. But Here's my son. He hit, you know, 398, um, you know, with four home runs, blah, blah, blah in, in his high school season. How much does that actually tell you? OK, so, well, a couple things on that. Uh, first off, if it's a if it's a father speaking on behalf of the, his son, that, then, then that's not something that we would really engage with. Um, you know, I think the the, the father son relationship shouldn't involve, you know, any kind of promotion. Um, uh, of the player to college coaches. I just, I, I think that ends up being a dead end because obviously, um, you know, from, from a coach's standpoint, the father's not a, a, a trustworthy resource the way yeah. that Bobby would be for, for some yeah. of his players. You know, I don't, I don't think I'm, and I'm a father myself. I don't think I'm in the best position to evaluate my little girls. You know, my oldest started playing soccer. I thought she was adorable. She wasn't the best player, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's, it's uh, it, that's something you got to keep in mind. And then the second thing is for me, particularly when you talk about high school, you know, which is a, a considerably lower level than junior college, um, the, the track records, yes or no. It's like, are you dominating the competition or not? Like whether a guy hit 398 or 410 or 430, 
that's not crazy important to me. It's, it's, is he the best guy on the field most of the time, you know, yeah. it, because in an average, you know, we're a division one program and, and I'm, I don't have the exact statistics, but it's something like 2% of high school be- baseball players at the most end up in division one. I think it may even be less than that. And what that means is if one high school team runs out nine guys, another high school team runs out nine guys, the division one player should be the best guy on the field most of the time. You know, it, 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 it it should be something where, you know, what I always say in our, in our recruiting meetings is like, Hey, look, if, if we sent my wife to the game, she should be able to say, Oh, this is the guy UMBC is recruiting. He's the best guy. You know, it it shouldn't be crazy uh, complicated. Um, And, uh, you know, I think sometimes like reflecting on, on your experience and I was the same way, Dan, I thought it was really good in high school. We were winning all these games and and Mm -hmm. I got to college. I figured out I was not good and, uh, (laughs) and, (laughs) and needed to, needed to grow and get better. But, um, I think a lot of times the guys who think they're they're hidden or, or underexposed, it's just a lack of recognition, just how many really talented and really outstanding players there are out there, guys who work really hard, and you just got to be respectful of that. Yeah. Bobby, where you fall? Because I know you want to hear your opinion here too. Yeah, but I mean, see, Liam said it a few times now, and it just keeps like hit me in the face because it's like, the music to my ears is that the, if you want to play at the level that he you're coaching at division one, you have to be the best player on the team. You can't be batting seventh on your, on your travel team and tell me that, well, you know, these are my, this is my list of schools and it's seven division one schools. No, that's not this, that travel team must be absolutely loaded. And if that's the case, then they should all go to one division one school and win a national championship because mm-hmm. it just doesn't happen like that you know the it's funny that you said you know the parent is probably the worst resource and it's true because they always obviously see the best in in their kids but the the hardest part for me when i'm advising younger players is to take a step back are you the even the best player on your own team and if you're not, then that needs to be the, you got to strive to be there before you, before you send out 50 emails to division one schools. And, you know, that they always, all these resources have the metrics, you know, the uh, division one shortstop runs a six, eight or better. He throws 86 or better. And those are great. And it's good resources, but I don't think people take into account that that's the basement of like the minimum that if you're opening emails from these players that you'll even entertain that they may be good enough. It's okay. Now we'll put you in the, you know, on the watch list of guys that have at least a tool that's division one worthy. And now you need to be better performer than the rest of those guys. And it's just, it's that narrow funnel that as you go up the lat, the baseball ladder that I think people have the opposite view of it. It's that once you hit, you know, once I throw 88, I'm division one and that's it. It's not the case. It's you throw 88 and you also perform very well. And you also have some polish and there's so many things that go into, and you can speak to it as a, as a recruiting guy. Um, There's so many things that go into finding really good players. And there's so many really good players and junior colleges is littered with guys that could play division one baseball and professional baseball. And it, you know, it's, everyone's got their own path, but, but man, the, the funnel gets so narrow as you get closer, you know, to the higher levels that I don't think people realize how difficult it actually is. So if I'm summing you up, it sounds like if you want to be the mayor of Chicago, first be the mayor of your own home. (laughs) Thankfully my wife is sleeping. (laughs) But one no, thing that's, got, a, that, that's a good point. I mean, no, it, it both of what you guys said is spot on. I mean, obviously there are exceptions, right? I mean, some depending on where you live, you might say, well, my, my, my high school sent off seven guys to D1 last year. Sure. But as you really average out the country, like my high school, like we were a successful, like respected high school program, Beller High School, and we didn't send anyone to D1. Like my whole, my whole four years in high school. And there's some good players, like some athletic, talented kids it all averages out. Right. So if you're someone out there, you live in like, you know, a a major Metro area, you have, you're at one of those big schools. Um, Some of those big schools cut 
D2 players, right? Like you could be a, a legitimately good catcher and be behind a stud D1 guy who's just like starting above you. And that's like being a third baseman in the Yankees organization back when A-Rod was playing, right? There's those stories too. Um, speaking of which, Liam, how does, how does a kid approach a situation like that? Say you're good, but you're at a program that's stacked. How do you get out, of, out from under that sort of that, that rubble? Are you talking about at the, the high school level or the college level? High school uh, level. So say, high say school. you go to like St. You know, John's Prep or like I know they're a very respected program here in the D.C. area. Say you go there and you're a really, really good player, legitimately can play in the college level, but you're behind, you know, some juniors or seniors and you're really not getting the playing time you need. Sure. I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy and, and, and I kind of talked about this at the top. I'm going to default towards you know, just, just trying to, to dump the tank to, to be the best teammate and, and part of a, an elite group that you can be. And then there's, there's going to be somebody out there, if you have legitimate college ability, there's going to be somebody out there that values um, that ability and that connection to, to winning that you've had in your past. And it may not be a, a high-end Division One program, you know, because it, the truth is, if, if you're a high-end division one player, you're finding a way to start for any high school team in the country, the best yeah. high school team in the country. If, if you're an impact division one player, you're going to find your way on the field. Um, I, I just think that's the nature of the levels. And, and there's some great high school teams out there that the guys are recruiting coordinator uh, before he got to us was the head coach of the number one high school team in the country. They were loaded. They weren't sitting any impact division one players. I promise you, uh, yeah. he'd tell you the same thing. Um, but somebody's going to value that. And he had guys on his team. He'd be able to speak to it um, really well, but he had guys on his team who went to smaller schools who were super players, you know, and guys who not only had some ability, but because they were part of such an elite team, they understood what, what winning takes and the investment that's required. And they've been a great part of those teams. And that that's a great outcome. Like, like, yeah. I, I just think we, we've got to get away from, um, you know, using where guys play as a measuring stick and, and, and think more about, well, what are they giving to whatever situation they find themselves in? And I know, you know, our, our recruiting coordinator's name, Ryan Terrell. I know the guys who played for him, it, even the ones who didn't end up at, at big, big programs, you know, they're making a great contribution wherever they are. Gotcha. So that kind of, I want to segue into one of the <laughs> hot Twitter topics. Um, so as players, all right, you got, your contract, you're showing up on campus. So one of the big things that I'm vehemently against in college baseball is pitch calling. So, but there seems to be this notion that, you know, at seemingly every level, you pitchers just don't, you guys just don't know how to do it. So we're going to hold your hand. We're going to, we're going to call this for you because you have too much going on in the field. You know, whatever the reason is, there's lots of, I've heard a laundry list of reasons because there was a really long Twitter thread I was involved in. You know, I put a thing about, it's like a couple months ago, I'm like, I don't like pitch calling in college baseball or at really any level in general. A lot of people supported it. Some people didn't. Um, but I think there's this idea that when you get to college, especially bigger programs, like you don't know how to do it, which is very true to some extent. But then it's like, we're going to we're going to call this game. How do you where do you fall in the pitch calling? Um, I know a little bit about where you fall, but give me your your perspective on pitch calling in reference to a pitcher's development and what the college's role is, is in really developing them as far as like the mental side of the game. Sure. Sure. So when I was the pitching coach, I called pitches at, at UMBC. And the reason was because the, the video prep that you need to do to, to, I think, to be able to suitably call pitches was something that, you know, that was my responsibility. And, and that's what I had the time to do. And that's what our head coach wanted me to do. And I, I gladly did it. I definitely think if, if there's not any like advanced scouting being done, there's, there's no reason for the coach to call the pitches whatsoever. Um, you know, if it's a, particularly I see summer games where both coaches are calling pitcher pitches. And I, I know for a fact that neither coach has done any advanced work on understanding the opposing lineup that that strikes me as, as not the right move and a, a misdevelopment opportunity for the pitchers and catchers. What we do now at UMBC with me as the head coach is I've stopped calling pitches. Um, it's something that I, uh, as, as, as I went through the years, uh, I, I kind of kept thinking, gosh, there's gotta be a better way instead of me trying to control this part of the game, you know, uh, there's, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a middle ground essentially where, where I do the advanced work that we need that the guys can't do because it's not pro baseball. They have to go to class. They can't watch tape the way that I watch tape. And we understand that, but maybe where I do the advanced work, but the players still have authority over, you know, 
how they uh, attack hitters. So we've kind of landed on sending the catcher out there with the scouting report, having a pitch calling system, just having um, a structure that we can teach the guys so that they can, uh, you know, attack different hitters in the way that we think is uh, the, the best and, um, and then respond to things that happen, you know, during at bats. And, and that, and that, that's also part of that's the structure. And then part of that's just me having conversations with the catchers and pitchers um, throughout the game and making sure everybody's on the same page. So at the youth level, do you feel like, cause this is, and I completely agree with everything you said. One of the things I heard consistently at the youth level was, well, we're throwing them out into the, we're throwing them to the wolves. We're throwing them into the, we're the throwing them out into the fire. <laughs> do you I mean, as I, I had to laugh at, as I regurgitated that, but um, I mean, do you really feel like pitching is that hard, especially at the younger levels where if you don't tell a kid where to throw the ball, you're throwing them to the wolves? No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, don't. Um, the, the, I think pitch selection is generally pretty overrated, even at our level, even at the big league level. Um, I, agree. I, 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 agree. I, I honestly believe this. I think pitch execution is a little bit underrated. And um, I just think that if you, we all only have so much time with our players is the way I feel, you know, you really got to squeeze the most out of those minutes. And I would invest those minutes in, you know, continuing to grow guys ability to execute, you know, rather than, um, you know, the, whatever time it would take to, to call pitches myself. You know, that's, that's my feeling. Yeah. And it's one of those things. And Bobby, I want to hear your, your input on, on pitch calling as well, but there's so many probabilities involved and there's a book uh, it's by pro poker player, Annie Duke, it's called thinking in bets. And I really like her book and I've tweeted about it a bunch of times. So I think it has a lot of relevance to, to pitch calling and, and baseball in general. But when you start thinking about all the probabilities that are involved in pitch calling, from a third person who's not on the mound, who doesn't know how the pitcher feels, like what the pitcher's confident in, what the pitcher saw, what the catcher might have, might have seen that you don't have access to, or you're not privy to from the dugout. Then you start talking about, is this the correct pitch? It's just a probability of, it's just a guess of whether you think it's the right pitch. And it's, again, based on all of those factors. Then the probability is, is this pitcher going to execute that pitch? Then the probability is like, what's the hitter thinking, right? He, he has some role in this as well. It's not just an absolute the slider was the right pitch. Well, maybe the hitter is like, well, this guy throws a lot of sliders and O2 counts. So now the probability that slider works goes down. So when you start to factor in all these probabilities, like you said, does calling fastball low and away, how relevant is that pitch even at that point? Right. Um, Cause they may, they might execute the pitch. They might not the hitter that might, that might be the right pitch for that hitter. It might not. And we're all just sort of guessing if the pitcher's confident in it, if he can make that pitch, like all these factors sort of align to the point where it's, I think so nebulous. It's just such a, almost a guess that it seems like if someone's going to guess, let it be the guy throwing the dang ball. Bobby, what do you think? You know, the your ch I jumped in that thread on Twitter and I think I, took it to a different level with well you want to fight Parker. everyone you're like get get in let's get in the alley let's stop talking get out your fists <laughs> <laughs> but that that kind of that's that comes along with the guys that are that are preaching the development of players and then hand holding them all the way through and uh, you know and from the youth level i coach i'm a run a travel baseball organization there's no reason ever for any of the coaches i have to call pitches because we're not here to win games. The kids are here to get better. They're playing games to get better. At the college level, I argued this on Twitter and I said it again. I said, if you're, you're, this is your livelihood. If you feel like you need to call pitches because you've, like Liam said, you've, he's got the time to look at the scouting report. He under, he's got, he knows more about these play, the players are playing against than maybe the catcher had time because he also had English 101 at 9 a.m. Then, yes, absolutely, the coaching call pitches. I don't have an issue with that, but, uh, you know, I think the, the overlap was we had, we had coaches, Twitter coaches claiming that, you know, the, the college coach is calling pitches for the development of the, the pitcher and catcher, which didn't make sense to me. I can see they're going to learn regardless because they're in the game, but to have them make those mistakes on their own would probably be a better learning curve, uh, in essence, then maybe having someone handhold them pitch by pitch, but 
college baseball is a different animal where it's, you know, they're, you guys are, this is how you make your living. This is your job. And you get judged what I would assume is more wins and losses. So, you know, I mean, it's not all wins and losses. I know the classroom plays a part. I know it's being a good, you know, good uh, in the athletic department, uh, you know, all the things go into that. But if your team goes two and 54, three years in a row, I can't imagine you're going to have the job much longer. So it's, you know, if you feel like you have to call pitches as a college coach, then absolutely. But for the development, you know, if you, you got freshmen in high school playing summer baseball, let that catcher, tr- let him, let him, let's see if he can read a hitter who's late on an 82 mile an hour fastball and keep throwing down the one instead of, well, he swung at a fastball. So now it's time to call something different or let, you know, let him learn a little bit. And that's, that's my only that's my only hard stance on, on pitch calling. And I was a shortstop. So, you know, I'm watching that I'm seeing the pitches and, and I remember playing thinking we shouldn't be calling this pitch. Like, why is he calling this pitch? We, yeah. did we just see what the, what the previous swing was. And there's been times where I can remember running out to the mound and be like, Hey, what the hell are you thinking? Like this kid. And then, and then he was like, get back in your lane, sir. Go to yeah, shortstop and mm-hmm. field a bouncing ball. Get well, that's when I, that's when I took the ball and, and I jumped on the mountain. I was a relief pitcher. Yeah. So that's and just, you know, and that's valid. I think everything you said is, is spot on the, uh, still the idea of, like you said, learning. And I have like one of my most vivid memories, like as we were talking earlier about what you take from your, from your sport, like what you really, the memories you keep, I learned from all my worst. And of course, and this is where the balance is, right? Like we can't be like, Oh, college world series. Hey, great learning experience. Like you want to win that game. You want to avoid learning experiences. Like when you can, right. Um, I got walked off. I gave a walk off two run bomb on what was clearly in hindsight, the wrong pitch call. I will never forget that till the day I die. It's a, it's like a photographic memory of that whole me blowing fastballs by this guy, like eight in a row. And I'll briefly give you the situation. I was, uh, it was like the ninth or 10th inning tie game on the road, winning runs on the second one out former big leaguers up. And so fast guy on second, a single is going to win the game for them. So I'm throwing it by him. He's very light spraying the ball into the dugout late, 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 late. And I'm thinking in my head, this guy played in the big leagues. I throw 92, 93, 94. I don't throw 98. He's certainly at some point going to like catch up, make an adjustment and just punch a ball through the right side. That's a reasonable like thought in your brain. That's like, you know, the angel or devil on your shoulder, whichever you want to attribute it to. And so what I did is like, I'm going to beat him to this adjustment. And I threw a curveball. Now, if I bounce that curveball, he probably still whiffs because he's still getting ready early. But I hung it. I threw it right over the middle of the plate and he banged it out of the ballpark, destroyed it. And everyone's like, you're the dumbest human we've ever met. (laughs) What were you doing? And for me, as someone who like, I pride myself on being a smart baseball guy, I was mortified, the embarrassment and just like, I still know everything I was thinking about in that situation. It was a great learning experience because it reminded me, even I was 28 that year and I was good. Um, you can't try to like take external stuff. You have to trust what you're, what you're seeing in front of you. And even though guys in the dugout can maybe see better than I could, I like, I still trust in my instincts. They were wrong. And I learned that what the hitter is telling me is still the most important thing. You can't jump to scouting reports. Oh, on the, on the ninth pitch scouting report says he, he makes adjustments. Like you need to trust what you can see right then and compete with your best. And my best was still my fastball. And at some point I probably would have got him just to hit a weak ground ball or pop up or something but that that stayed with me the rest of my career and it was important for my development even as a 28 year old old dude and if you don't let kids have those moments I think it comes back to being a google maps kind of moment and Bobby I I think I've used this analogy with you is when you're in a new town and you're riding around with google maps and just like I gotta go to Chipotle google maps tell me to turn left you don't learn the landscape very well at all but when you don't have Google Maps, or you're on foot, like I, I'm new to DC, as I get away from other people directing me, and I have to go, okay, I'm going to turn left at that big church. Or, you know, my sister said, I got to wait for this cemetery, then take a right. You start really seeing the landscape, and you start to really start to understand what's in front of you. And that was the same way in pro ball, where my job was on the line. If I pitch bad for three weeks, I go home. 
Uh, guys have told me in the bullpen that this hitter can do this, this, and this. I'm watching how every swing turns out so that I can make a better pitch on the next one. But if someone's just saying, throw a slider, throw a curveball, throw a fastball, you don't get those. You're not watching hitters as intently. You're not learning and seeing those cues because you don't have that stake in it. Even if the coach sits you down in the dugout afterward and says, hey, this is why I called a slider there, which is great. That's like, I appreciate that about coaches who do call pitches, but you also can't do that every pitch. Liam, I mean, could you sit down with your pitchers between every pitch and, and, and talk, like you have a, a second in the, in the dugout, right? For sure. And I think when we're talking about calling pitches, if, if you're ever trying to reduce it to one individual pitch, I just like like you said, there's just too many variables. There's too much going on to really be able to, to say anything definitively about one pitch. You know, I've, I've heard guys say, oh, well, you know, we lost because the guy got the game winning RBI on the because uh, we called the wrong pitch. And, and I just I, I kind of resist that. I think when, when we're talking about pitch calling, for me, it's more about designing, well, what pitch mix does this guy have to use to be the most effective for our team and make sure we're staying true to that. So for a guy like yourself, Dan, you know, you, you just have to throw a certain percentage of fastballs on the inner half of the plate to make sure yeah, your stuff sure. works, you know, like, like that's just who you are. And we got to make sure we're staying true to the, the things that help us deliver value for our team. It's not as much about, well, you know, that foul ball, what did this off the bat. So we absolutely have to throw a breaking ball, in the next pitch. I just think we try and make things definitive because we're uncomfortable with, with how gray pitch calling is. And like you said yourself, you know, if you bounce that breaking ball, you, you may not have gotten that learning experience. You know exactly. what I mean? Like, like, I, didn't, I didn't want that learning experience. Yeah, <laughs> No doubt. I've, I've had a few of my lear learning experiences of my own, but like, believe me, I could, I could go through uh, some bad ones, but the, uh, to me, Part of that story is, is, is what you learn, but part of that story is there's more in our sport. There's usually more than one way to get guys out. Like, like, like For it, sure. it, it, it's, it's almost never a deal where it's like, Hey, look, if we don't throw this one pitch, he's, he's absolutely going to be on base. So that, that's usually not the case. It's usually if we execute our stuff, you know, our skill set, we're going to have a really good chance to get the guy out. It's just the way the sport's built. So, yeah. And I think that's a good point. And uh, you start to think about some of the most fearsome hitters, that you can think of like Barry Bonds in his day, Mike Trout. They're just like, maybe there's only like two ways, you know, someone who isn't, doesn't have electric stuff like me. Like I had good stuff, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't throw 98. Maybe I have only like three ways I could get him out and in bat. Maybe Andrew Miller has like seven ways he could get him out. You know, maybe some guy, you know, Jamie Moyer only had like one way he could get him out um, when he was pitching. So when you start talking about like, what's the key to get this guy out? Like what, what lock unlocks that door? Like you said, at lower levels, there's a lot more. Like you're a youth pitcher, you get a guy low, out low and away with a fastball, in with a fastball, up with a fastball, middle with a changeup, down with it, like anywhere with a changeup, right? And then as the level gets bet, gets higher, that's where the nuance comes in, like you said. And and now it's like, all right, there's still a lot of ways to get this hitter out. So we don't have to be super precise. So let's just go with your strengths. What do you do well? There's going to still be a bunch of ways to get a guy out with what you have. It doesn't have to be perfect and I think that's a I think it's a good way of, of talking about it a hundred percent man I, I've coached some guys who are really good pitchers you know guys who set records at our school and you know won awards in our league and, and whatever else I can honestly say every good pitcher I've ever coached has succeeded through executing their identity rather than trying to pick the lock of every hitter that they face there might be a couple over the course of the year where it's like hey this guy's a really good hitter He's going to take away some of our usual options. Let's make sure we're, you know, we're doing things a certain way against him. Even at our level, which is a good level of baseball, you know, 90 plus percent of the hitters, it's really going to come down to do we deliver our skill set for our team? And, 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 and that's what gets out. So I, I firmly, firmly believe that. And that's why it was easy for me to step away from pitch calling, you know, and just make sure that, you know, rather than spending that effort, you know, trying to pick a lock, like I'm saying, just, let me just educate our pitchers and catchers are, Hey, here are how our guys need to be successful. You know, let's stay true to that. Yeah. And I think, um, and, and Bobby, I know you want to segue here in a second, but um, I think the other thing that's, that's confusing when we all think about pitch calling is what evidence do we have a lot of times that it's successful when your team is winning a lot of games. And this was like some, some winning high school coach who calls all his pitches. He was really upset at me back in this Twitter conversation back in January. Um, it's like, 
in high school baseball, if you're winning a lot of games, you probably just have a lot of really good players. And pitch calling is a very tiny sliver of that. So let's not attribute your success to pitch calling. And the other thing is when um, when your program isn't doing super well, like when you're not winning more games than you lose, are you are you like reevaluating your pitch calling? Like I, I don't think there's a checks and balances. I don't think there's a there's there's no controlled studies here showing like okay, like Dan used to be a D1 pitcher. Now he's for the you know he's the pitching coach for University of of uh, wherever. And I call the pitches. We go twenty and thirty. Do I am I allowed to call pitches next year? Like like was I did I do good? It doesn't seem like it because we didn't win, right? Like who's saying who's like giving us the keys to keep doing this and who's saying we're certified to call pitches you know what i mean like there's no real good sense of this is an industry-wide thing we've been calling pitches for forever but who's actually good at it like who's to say your coach is good at calling pitches who's to say that it's working for your team it's just like if you really start to think about the whole industry of it because i really want it to change i really want amateur players to be calling their game top to bottom and then at college it's a little more difficult like whatever if it changes a little bit fine but I don't like this idea of throwing it to the wolves. And I think it just, it just can be better. And I, I appreciate that you guys are doing that. I, I'm, I'm happy that my alma mater is one of only probably a couple dozen schools in the country that are doing it. Cause very few D ones let their players call the game. Yeah, that's uh, I think I'll be the authority on pitch calling from now on. So if anybody's got any questions, just ask me and I'll let you know. Um, Liam, I'm, I'm actually on Twitter in the, Tim asked a question. So I want to, I want to ask you again, I'm curious as well, because, you know, this past season being canceled and the NCAA mandate of extra year of eligibility, you know, that's going to put some, some new stresses on college coaches in general on what, how to navigate the the rosters and everything. And um, I was, Tim, I'm just going to read your question. And I assume he's probably got a 2021 high school grad. Um, and he just asks, you know, what's your advice for the 2021s who are losing their high school season and potentially their summer season? You know, what what should these guys be doing right now if they want a shot at playing? He just says college baseball, but just more specifically, I guess, Division One baseball. Sure. I mean, I, I think you have to look at it as an opportunity, you know, to, to really invest in development. I think. It, obviously this is a this is a horrible situation. It's a terrible public health situation. I'm not minimizing that in the slightest, um, you know, but if, if we're going to look at it on a kind of a micro level with, with the, the way the guy asked the question, it, I think if I were a 2021 high school grad, or if, if, you know, a guy that we would want on our team, the, the way that I would want them approaching it is it's a, in, inside of this chaotic situation, there's opportunity with people for, with the right mindset. So it, I would want that guy thinking, Hey, look, other people are going to sleep in. Other people are going to play video games. Other people are going to slack off and I'm going to pass them because I'm going to get the most out of each day. And I'm going to get the most out of um, this opportunity to really focus on development. So even if it's not the situation that you would have ordered up or anybody would have ordered up, if, if I were a young player that had the right mindset to be successful, then I would be excited about, the fact that, um, you know, the whole recruiting picture picture has become a little bit more unsettled because I think the right guys are going to make the most of that. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, I wanted to segue a little bit uh, regarding your seniors specifically, because I had, I had tweeted something right when this happened um, and people were basically stumping, you know, seniors need to get their year back and their eligibility and get, you know, get their last season of college baseball. And I'm all for it. And I, I think it's a good thing that NCAA gave everybody that extra year of eligibility. And, um, you know, I know they're leaving a lot to the schools as far as scholarships and stuff like that to kind of work out on their own, but how many, I guess, how many seniors did you guys have this season? And do you expect all of those guys to come back next year? Have you had those conversations with those players, uh, yet? Oh, we, we have. Yeah. And we're, we're actually on to our juniors and getting their uh, long range plans figured out. We only had four seniors. We were a young team. So that made it a little easier for us than maybe some schools that were a little bit more senior heavy of the four. One is going to come back. Um, and for him, it's it, a lot of it's the academic fit. He just happened to, to take a major where we have some really strong grad programs and he was he's going to be able to 
to get a lot of academic value out of this uh, additional year. Whereas our other seniors, their ability to get the academic value out of it wasn't the same, you know, just because of the majors they were in or their own plans for, for after baseball. Um, because I think once you get away from the emotion of losing a season, which we all felt, you know, we were all really excited for the, the weekend series we had coming up and getting in the conference play. We we're actually just starting to play okay and starting to get some, some of these young guys settled in. Um, I, I think it, it becomes a little bit more of a, um, a business decision where if a, a guy's a senior and he's going to graduate from a school like UMBC, which is a, a great school, and he's looking at a, a job opportunity next year where he's going to make fifty or $60,000, you know, we don't have the ability as a baseball program to, to give them a full scholarship, as you guys know, as I'm sure the people, right. the people listening know. So if it's going to cost them, let's just say it's going to cost them $20,000 all told to come to our school next year, even with some help from us, but they're giving up 60, that's 80,000 bucks. You know, I think if, if you're, if you're being realistic and you're a guy who maybe doesn't have pro ball in his future and you're looking at, 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 that kind of value proposition, you say, you know, Hey, look, I've gotten some great memories. You know, I've, I've been able to, to build some, some lifelong relationships. I'm going to move on to something else that I'm excited about. And for the three guys that are doing that, we're, we're, we couldn't be happier for them. I mean, that's the end goal of our program is to whenever they're gone, whether it's pro ball or, or, or something else, they're excited and prepared for it. So that's interesting because that that's, ex that's, what the situation is with your three seniors leaving and one coming back. That is what I echoed. And I said, when this, when the dust settles, there's going to be a lot more kids taking, you know, taking into account the financial aspect and the business decision it is to come back. And I got a lot of pushback and I get a lot of, I don't want to say angry, um, you know, lashing out to tweets at me, but there were a lot of people, you know, players and, uh, adults alike that said, you know, you'd be surprised how many kids are going to want to come back. And my argument was always, it's not that they don't want to come back. I mean, I left college after my junior year. Um, I got drafted to play, but I would love to go back for another year of college and play in my, with my teammates and everything. That's not the issue. It's the, it's the financial ramifications and it's the, you know, the, is there going to be a spot? Am I a, am I a big time contributor? Am I going to want to stay on the bench and potentially, you know, spot start? I mean, there's a lot of factors that go in, like you said, and you're, you're really preparing 99% of the, the guys on your team for life after college and after baseball, you know, that once you put the emotion aside, I really don't think that the majority of players will end up coming back whether to college for that, for that extra season. And as much as they might want to. Yeah, and I, I, I feel the same way because once you get past, maybe it's like a couple weeks or a month of not being in baseball, and I've done this multiple times because of my arm injuries, baseball is like doesn't remember the year around. It's hard to like get back in base in baseball mode. And you're very much like sort of in the real world. And then you have to really think like the emotions out of it. The you know, it's very different when you can smell the grass, you're on the field in your cleats wanting to come back. But then when you're out of it and you gotta go, okay. If I do come back, it's going to be 10 more months of school, which sucks. Like school sucks. Let's be, I mean, some people love school, but I didn't love school. 10 months of school, a lot of money, a lot of practice, the conditioning that sucks. I still have an injury. There's still a chance I get injured. I can come back for my next season and blow out my knee, blow out my ankle, blow out my arm. Um, there's a lot of factors. It's not just like, let's suit up again in June, right? If it was that, everyone would come back but it's a long road to come back for just eight weeks of baseball, 12 weeks of baseball, whatever it is, you know, it varies. And it's not that it's not a big of a window. No doubt. And, and, and to me, it's just got to make sense for the guy's future, particularly academically. Like I, I just, I, I want to, with our program, even with this opportunity to bring guys back for a fifth year, which obviously, as you guys know, extends to the juniors, sophomores and freshmen that were on our team this year. I want to avoid a situation where a guy is, uh, really just at our, our school and in our program for the baseball opportunity, he has to be getting some kind of value academically. It could be finishing up his bachelor's degree on a different timeline. It could be taking something post-grad, but I wouldn't be caring for our players the way that, you know, I, I want to, and I, I expect to as the head coach, if I was just kind of extracting whatever value we could get from them from a baseball standpoint and essentially wasting their time. 
otherwise. Like I'm, I'm not interested in that. So that's been part of, you know, when I say I've, I've been busy during this time, that's been part of it is, you know, looking at each player on our roster and saying, well, you know, let's think about having this guy here for an extra year. What would be the value academically for that player to be here? And in the case of the player, the senior that we have coming back, I think it's going to be really good for him. I think he's going to end up yeah. with a, with a post-grad credential that instead of him having to pay for it at some point in his career, he's a really good student and it's going to be great um, when he hangs up his cleats or whatever he chooses, we're going to be able to help, help take some of that burden away. And he's going to keep um, being able to run out there and represent our school. So I, I think that's a great situation, uh, but it, it's going to vary guy to guy. And, and that's just going to be part of it. Yeah. So I, I'd like to get your, your input on, um, basically the phenomenon of analytics. I know it's starting to trickle down into baseball. And I know you guys are college baseball. I know you guys are using some video tools more than some of the other things out there, but tell me about some of the, the tech stuff that you're using and where it, where it helps you and, and where maybe you say, okay, this is kind of where it ends for us. Like, I, cause I know, like you said, you're pretty balanced and you know, things are, they're going to help you with some things. And again, they're going to help you, um, win games and in, in to some extent and measure players and all that stuff, but it's not the end all be all for you guys, but like what stuff are you using and how do you use it? So obviously that's a, that's a big umbrella uh, analytics. I think you can kind of further divide it in, in between, um, you know, looking at uh, player value in, in, in a different way than maybe we grew, grew up with on the back of baseball cards. I think we were, we're pretty heavy into that, um, you know, making sure, that we're evaluating our own guys by the right kinds of metrics. And then there's the tech side, which we definitely use. I mean, it, it's, it's something, um, you know, that, that we've, uh, we've been uh, enthusiastic about when we feel like it serves our purpose, you know, like we have our guys, you know, throw on a rap soto different times of the year. We have guys, um, we do a, a bat speed program where we make, measure exit velocity. It's a part of our training uh, to, to continue to grow guys in that way. I think you can definitely get caught when it comes in the comes to particularly tech and player development. You can get caught um, acquiring more information than you have the ability to process and make relevant. You know, that's something that we're really mindful of. You know, we don't have, we're not an SEC program. We don't have, you know, four guys in the office crunching numbers and spitting them back out to the players in a, in a way that's actionable and relevant for them. You know, we have to be really yeah. mindful of not, uh, overcrowding things and really making sure that we're able to eliminate distractions and keep the guys focused on what's important. Um, so there, there's that piece of it. And then I also think kind of a little bit of what I said before, you can get into a little bit of an analytic echo chamber where it, it, it just be doing things in a, in a particular style or in a particular way becomes its, its own justification. And, and I don't think that's right. I mean, I think if we, if we went out there and we held the fat end of the bat, and swung it that way, but we won the America East that like that would, I'd, I'd be fine with that. You know, even if it wasn't <laughs> necessarily the, the, the way the, you know, the, the analytics community would want us to do it. So um, I, I, I hope I'm, I'm not sounding too like old school or anything like that because you're a Luddite. You're a Luddite. Oh, well, well see well, that's so funny <laughs> to me, Dan, because like, I'm a guy, I grew up reading Bill James stuff. I, I, I think I, I, I still own the first baseball prospectus you know, I, I, I'm, I think I'm pretty well versed um, in this, in, in the, particularly anything that has to do with player development. You know, I'm, I'm a early uh, Paul Nyman reader, all that stuff. I just think my job as the head coach is to um, be a bit of a curator of that. And, and, and I just think if, if, if your whole approach to player development is, is we're just going to out tech everybody. I just don't think you're thinking about the end user enough and thinking about the competitive environment enough. That's my two cents. Yeah, I agree. And, and there was, uh, this has been happening in the fitness world for a while as well on a different sense. So like there's a, uh, a spine doctor, Dr. Stuart McGill. And like, basically if you learn anything as a, as a fitness trainer about how to help people when they have back pain, which is one of the hardest things to train around because you can have back pain, leaning forward, leaning sideways, extending, like all this stuff. Back pain is one of the things that when I still had my academy, we were always programming around for like volleyball players. They have a lot of chronic back pain. Um, and so when you start to read into your research and like, what are the causes of back pain? What do we know about it? What is the research? There's this one researcher, Stuart, Dr. Stuart McGill, and he has some great books. He does a good job making it act like pretty, pretty layman. 
Um, but it's funny because after you read his whole spine book, you're like, I got it. What do I do now? It's like, do weighted carries. It's like, oh. <laughs> so I just read 300 pages of this and, and the answer to everyone's back pain is do weighted carries and go for walks and core, core, core work like may or may not work. But like, that's how it ultimately boils down. It boils down into doing something, right? And that's, I think, to your point, which is all the pitching drills that I've been using, because in my academy, I was kind of a Luddite. I didn't buy a Rhapsodo. I didn't spring for a lot of this technology because mostly these kids, like we were talking off air, like you can't throw strikes. So who cares what, how fast your ball, your ball spins, right? Oh, for, for sure. I, I, our recruiting coordinator has a great line about it. He says, sometimes I feel like, in, in some of these indoor facilities, we're giving kids a bazooka who don't even have their gun license, you know, like it's a, you, you, I think, and this is why I'm so passionate, uh, you know, Dan, about trying to deliver value for whatever team you're on right now, because I really think, that, number one, it's, it, it's the right thing to do, just from a moral standpoint, you got to be good to the people around you. But number two, it's, it's, a, it's the best kind of development. It's applying whatever you've trained and whatever you're working on to a competitive situation. And I, I, I think that that ends up serving your long-term development. Like I, I think we're, we're really quick to talk about you know, performing in games versus training as a trade-off. And I, I, I just don't see it that way at all. Like I really think um, the, guys, the guys who can translate whatever they work on to the field, they have a chance to grow and keep getting better. And the guys who – struggle with doing that even if the 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 training piece continues to grow it's it's not going to be relevant you know and and we're seeing more of that than ever you know there's out there recruiting there's so many more guys particularly on the pitching side who are unbelievable for their age from a velocity standpoint or from a spin standpoint compared to you know where we were when I started working in college baseball but I just think there's more guys than ever that that have a hard time at translating it just because we don't spend as much time on that piece yeah Bobby, what do you think about translating some of this stuff into, into game results? I think Liam just became my best friend with what he just <laughs> said right there. I, you know, the, I, I've said it in a, few episode, a couple episodes before. I, the, the secret that nobody just says out loud is get stronger. Like anything that you want to do better requires you to be stronger. You know, there's, there's not many Pedro Martinez is walking around at 160 pounds, throwing 99 miles an hour. Like if you want to throw harder, you probably need to weigh more and get a lot stronger. Same thing with hitting. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to hit some of those benchmark numbers, you're probably just physically not strong enough. And yeah, the dance got uh, Did you see this yet? <laughs> I saw that, that, that the monstrosity of a kettlebell, this, you, uh, kettlebell you got there. Well, it's called a Thompson fat bell. This is so Donnie Thompson. He's like this uh, world record holding power lifter dude. And he like invented these. So it's like, if you hauled out a cantaloupe that was made of iron, then <laughs> you put your handle in it. But it's just like at a different center of mass. I got this one thing so I can try to do some fitness and not become super fat while I'm trapped in isolation. But anyway, go on. Well, that's, a, that's the, right. You're true. You need to get stronger. I mean, it's the, there is, I, I, I have yet to see a player who's improved his exit velocity 20 miles an hour. That was a bad hitter. Just become a good hitter because his metric number improved. Like I, I would encourage all players to be good at whatever skill you're trying to improve at and then get stronger and see where that takes you. Cause if you hit a buck 20 for your high school team, and spend the whole winter working on your exit velocity, I can almost assure you, you're going to hit a buck 20 again. And it's, it, you know, the, the translation, uh, you, everyone's preaching the numbers because a lot of recruiting is done by metric numbers, you know, rightfully so like you do need a certain benchmark of strength uh, to, to play at levels, you know, whether it's exit velocity, arm velocity or speed, but wait, 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 Liam, have you ever heard the term arm talent before? <laughs> I have heard the term arm talent. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thank in you. what, in what sport, in what sport? I, I, I seem to hear it in football. Um, and I, I'm not a, I'm not a major <laughs> consumer of the NFL in any respect, but, um, you know, you, you hear about a, um, 
you know, such and such quarterback coming out of college has a lot of arm talent, um, which uh, the way you guys are reacting, I, I can tell you kind of probably feel the same way about that term. I do. I'm a little, this, well, this, I, this is a Bobby <laughs> term. Yeah. Get it's a, it's a Bobby. me term. Okay. I said, I think it was one of the first episodes we ever did. I said, a guy's got a lot of arm talent. He's, you know, whatever. I was like, st- I like stopped everything. Like, yeah, Dan Law, <laughs> I mean, you Dan. mean arm, arm strength? Have you played baseball before? You're exposing yourself. That's not lingo no. from our industry. <laughs> so, so I, I think, um, I, I, I think we just have to be really clear on, on, on what the metrics are for, uh, in this conversation and, and what they are as eliminators. Like, like I, right. I couldn't play professional baseball cause I didn't throw hard enough. And those guys were exactly right. Like, I, it, it, my, my, whatever skill level I had, whatever I had worked up to as a college player, it just wasn't going to translate because I didn't throw hard enough. I couldn't move fast enough to, to play at the level that you guys played at. But the, with, wait, once you're, once you're in a level, once you're not eliminated, it's just, who's the best baseball player. Like, yeah, like right. and, and it's about translating those skills. And what I think is misunderstood in recruiting when it comes to our level is we are a terminal level of baseball for 90 plus percent of the guys. And I don't care if you're coaching at UMBC or a, a, a SEC school or an ACC school, like for the vast majority of the players who pass through the division one baseball, it's the most relevant baseball that they're, they're ever going to play in their career. Most guys don't get, you know, a significant professional opportunity after they play D one baseball. So the, when it comes to, you know, I have to manage our scholarship budget. Obviously, I did it as a recruiting coordinator, still do it as a head coach. When it comes to doling out those resources, it's who can win games while they're on money that year. It's not because, oh, well, I think this guy's, he has a lot of maybe arm talent, um, yeah, a lot of arm talent. <laughs> you know, and, and he's two years away from really helping us, but he could be a top 10 rounder. You know, we should invest a lot of money in him. No, like, like the guy has to help us win on the weekend right now. And, it, and if he can't, then it's a, it's more of a, roster spot camp invite tryout type of situation and that's what I think is really misunderstood you said it earlier Bobby you guys think oh well I just bumped 88 in a bullpen like you know I'm, I'm, I'm here for D1 it's like no you got to go you know the 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 the, the, the kind of the, the the other high school in your town you got to go pump them you know and, and put that 88 past them um, and, and and show you can do that that's what really qualifies you if we're doing our job correctly which I can speak personally we don't always do you know we make our share of mistakes well, you yeah. all, you have to balance the, the, the really high performers with the guys that also, you know, maybe he was a mediocre performer, but he's got a lot of the tools that you look for, the measurable tools. And, you know, it's not, there's no perfect science. I just, that, that's a lot of my, my uh, beef, I guess, on with the Twitter coaches or the guys that push tech and data and these buzzwords to players that, uh, you know, the run and the, a run and gun and throw the ball as hard as you can into a net is not indicative of how good of a baseball player you are. It's, it's a piece of the talent that you may have, but doing that and, and hitting a certain number does not, does not, uh, I guess, um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Make you, uh, make you good at sport. Make, not, it's make not, you it, good. it doesn't, it doesn't uh, just give you the right to be a, a division one player. If you okay. run and throw the ball hard into a net, it's yes. As a division one coach, he, uh, you know, you're going to look at everything that the player gives you, but it's not going to be, all right, he ran and threw 94 into a net. Um, but he's also got he's 10 innings pitched and 30 walks. Like yeah. he's just not, he's not there. It's a, it's a total package. And, and like, and like you said, and you, you alluded to a few times, you know, this might be the highest level that some of these guys ever get to, which is great because division one baseball is a very quality level of baseball. Like you need to perform because it becomes somewhat of a business and there's coaches that, you know, have a livelihood and they need guys that are going to help them win games and keep advancing their livelihood. So it's, there's so many you know, you try and convey that to, to prep players. And it, it sometimes it gets lost in the shuffle when you're reading on Twitter, like, Hey, you know, this, this guru, or this guy said, if I throw this hard, like I'm going to have a shot to play at the next level. Like, well, you may, and that may open a door for you, but that's not the only reason you're going to go to the next level. You need to have a, a more polished, you know, toolbox. 
R right. And the way that I would uh, approach it, um, maybe if I were talking um, more consistently to a, a, a broader array of, of young players is, you know, I'd probably use some of the, the same analogies that you do, Bobby. The, yeah. Like if you can, if you can uh, turn and throw a ball into a net 98 miles an hour, that, that potentially could open some doors for you. You need to prepare yourself as a young player. And we talk about this, you know, with our players is you need to prepare yourself that when your teammates are relying on you at our level, you can deliver for them because I don't know about you guys, you know, that some of the guys I played college baseball with, there's still, there's still some of my best friends. They were in my wedding. Like the idea of letting those guys down when it was my turn to deliver is, you know, it, it would have been sickening to me. And, and we want guys in that mindset. If it's a mindset of, well, you know, delivering for my teammates. Yeah. It'd be great if I could, but what's really important is my own physical development. Like, like that's a, that's more of a, um, like a, a bodybuilder type of mindset. And that's not really what, um, is, is going to be a great fit for us or, or I think really a great fit for any program that has any sort of ambition to, to win games at our level. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and then one thing you mentioned, I want to hear a little bit. So Liam, UMBC is not fully funded. And I think a lot of parents out there don't understand exactly what that means and, and the scholarship implications. Can you talk a little bit about the funding levels at in, in Division One baseball and how that affects you guys and, and others? Sure. So, you know, there's a, a limit in Division One baseball of 11.7 um, athletic scholarships for, for any team that, that plays at our level. We have less than that. Um, and, and I'm not sure the, the amount of teams that have less than that, but it's, it's more than I think parents and players would think. You know, I, I, I think there's, there's an idea out there that, hey, if you're Division I, everybody's very similar. It's, it's not the case. I mean, the, the, and, and, and this is not by any means, uh, you know, denigrating UMBC or our conference, but, you know, the investment in our sport and in our conference is different than it is, you know, in the ACC or SEC. That's just, that's part of college athletics. I think that's true across a lot of different sports. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's something where um, it, it definitely affects, you know, who you bring in and, and how much you can reward them for their baseball ability. And then, and then how much uh, the, the family can count on in terms of paying for college through a, a, a young guy's baseball talent. Cause I can tell you right now, you can be a, a phenomenal, you know, right-handed hitting outfielder you're probably going to get more of an academic scholarship at any place that you want to go to if you're an outstanding student than you are for being a great right-handed hitting outfielder um, just yeah. because, you know, the, 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 the scholarship money is, is really restricted for those types of profiles uh, because and they're more common. And how many rostered players? I mean, like how many guys suit up when you're in your program? 35 is, is the spring limit. Uh, we're usually uh, one or two or three over that in the fall. Uh, with guys that we're given an opportunity to, but um, we're down to 35 by the spring. So for you at home, you know, 35 players divided by even 11.7 scholarships is a third of a scholarship per player if it was all averaged out. So then if, you know, a school has nine scholarships or six or, you know, 7.5, that's just going to, again, give you an idea of like what the average amount every player might get. And of course the minimum is still 25%, right? And mm. um, I mean, how much arm talent do you need to get... <laughs> A full, a full ride somewhere. Do those well, really exist? No, they don't. Um, the, the only way that they would exist at, at our school, I can say, is if it were in combination. Yeah, book talent. A lot of book talent. <laughs> yeah, you got to right. you gotta have the, the, the book talent and then maybe some financial need, um, you know, where your family's able to attract some resources that way. But like, it, I, it, I, to me, if somebody says, oh, so-and-so got offered a full ride by, by such and such a school, like I, I immediately understand that that person is not giving me the the full picture um of information because i, I think i could speak for the the coaches in our conference and, and at our level in general like if, if we were in the business of giving certain players full rides uh, just on athletic money we wouldn't be able to to feel the competitive team we would just be too thin well not to mention you I mean you guys have you know you think about it in major league terms you might give a guy who's 28 who had his breakout season, you give him a six year, you know, $120 million contract. And there's a percentage of those guys that are busts. Like they get hurt. They don't perform as well. And if you're a division one school and you gave out a full ride scholarship to a guy as a high school senior, and then he shows up and he just can't hack it, which happens a lot more than people think, or he just gets in trouble or whatever. Now you've tied up a whole scholarship 
for four years and you're getting very little for it. So there's just, it's a, it's a big risk as well. Oh, sure. And, and in particularly at a school like ours, we're not a place where if a guy um, shows up to our school and he's just, he's just not able to affect winning the way that we expected, where we're just going to take that scholarship back. You know, it's, 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 that's not within our values. That's not within our mission. Like we're going to continue to provide for that guy the way that we promised to so that he can get his education. What that means from a competitive standpoint is, well, you know, we're married to the guys that we recruit, (laughs) you know, and and we got to make sure that instead of maybe trying to make a splash by committing a, you know, a 15 year old kid that everybody seems to think is going to be a really good player. We need to really dig and, and make sure that we're, uh, understanding exactly who we're bringing into a pro, into the program from a from a you know a, a mindset standpoint, from an academic standpoint, from a family standpoint, like it's it's got to be more thorough for us to really get it right. Yeah, and, and Bobby, I want to hear your perspective on this as well. But it kind of goes back to just like, and I I think parents and players get this more than they used to. But just how important your character is, people referencing for your character having a good attitude, hustling, working hard, getting good grades, because you're basically a trustee of this scholarship money and a school doesn't want to give away their precious scholarship money to some player who's then going to maybe drink his way out of, you know, out of the lineup in the first year or whatever it is, or just lazy. They're saying, we only have so much money. Can I trust you with it? And like, cause we need that to be competitive. Can I trust you with it? And scouts, I mean, you're going to games looking for ki- signs that a kid's you're looking for any sign to cross them off your list. I mean, is that kind of, is that kind of fair? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I mean, I think, I think what needs to be more broadly realized on the, the player and family side is just at our level supply vastly outweighs demand. Um, you know, like, like we have, we're going to go into the, uh, the summer, hopefully we're going to be out there. They're seeing some young guys play. Hopefully the, the health situation improves. We'll go into the summer with maybe four needs, you know, and, and there's kids on every field, you know, everywhere you look that can really play. Uh, I think that gives us the opportunity to be selective on some of the things that you referenced. You know, we, we don't have to, um, you know, take a guy who's, who's not a great culture fit or, or isn't going to be trustworthy academically um, just because, oh, we need to fill this need. I mean, there, there, there's more guys, you know, there, there's a ton of people who play this game and a ton of people who are really good at it. And that means those other things, become um a, a bigger and bigger factor but the, the 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 word i would use just to maybe put a bow on it is trust like you have to be able to trust your players and and if you recruit guys that are not trustworthy from a preparation standpoint from an effort standpoint from an academic standpoint uh, it's not going to work yeah for sure and i as a as someone who works with a lot of high school guys i when i talk to coaches i really I ask what needs are, you know, and I'll probably ask you when we get off, you know, if you have any needs for 2021s or, or 22s. And I really try my best to push surefire, no doubt division one players and people, you know, I, I don't put, you know, I I have a friend who's a, who's a D one recruiting coordinator. And he's like, you know, what do you got? And you have any lefties lefty arms for 2021. And I tell him flat out, I said, no, I don't mm. like, I don't have a guy that can pitch at your level. I have a guy that's good, but he's 80 to 80 to 81. And he's, you know, 150 pounds and he's probably, he's just not going to be there. Like he, he's not going to walk on the campus and, and fit on the roster. Like you really try and be honest. And I think that's, you know, if I'm going to be honest to the college coaches and to the families that they really need to be honest with themselves and look at, you know, division one players, look different and you know money is at a premium and you really need to you have to be honest with yourself on where you fall and and how you know how this process plays itself out and it's you know the 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 guys that are going to get to that level are going to get there because they they worked so hard and they forced yourself there you know it's it doesn't happen by chance Sure. And, and, and the thing that I would maybe, I don't think I've said this yet, but I, I try and work it in anytime I get an opportunity to, to speak to, to parents or, or young players is, and, and I'm, I'm really talking to the players here more so that I would hope this would come from the players more than the, the parents kind of dragging them through it. But if you think you're a division one player, then I would just urge you to 
drive to the the closest division one school when they're playing a midweek game and test, you know, really measure yourself up against the, the last three guys in the lineup and whoever the midweek starter is for the team that you want to play for. And if you're not better than those guys, then it's, it, it, that's a signal that, you know, development is what is in order. Um, if you, if you think you're as good or better than those guys, then, you know, find a way to get in front of that coach, go to their camp. You know, it, it, we're always looking to improve our roster. I think that's, that's something that gets lost. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, we're not looking to fill out the roster when we're filling out the roster. We're usually filling it out with people who are going to add a lot of cultural value and can provide us depth. Sure. When we're, when we're looking to improve the roster, when we're talking about scholarship positions, it's going to be, Hey, you know, who is on our team right now where, um, and, and, and is not maybe being as productive as we would like? That's an area we want to improve. Now who can we go out and get that can improve that? And I, I just, it's, it's more of a zero sum game than people realize. Like, I think if, if you're a guy who pitches and you want to play for UMBC and you come out and see us play and our midweek starter throws harder than you has better secondary, has better command, defends his position better and defends the running game better then it's, it, it's time to get to work. And that's okay. You know, for, for young telling young players that, it, Hey, you need to keep growing. You need to keep getting better. is okay. You know, that's, that's what it's about. Yeah. So I have one last question uh, and this can be for both of you, but um, obviously when I was in college, which is got it eons ago now, I remember our head coach, when we got there, he said, listen, I don't ever want to hear from your parents. If you don't like your playing time, if you don't like this or that, he's like, you come to me, don't your mom, your dad, never call me, never email. And super nice guy. Like he loved my parents, like the most cordial, polite, chat them up when they're there on campus for a visit. But he's like, never call me. So I'm going to throw this to Liam first and then to Bobby. Um, has that changed in college sports? Because back then I didn't, I was not aware of any incidents where a parent was crossing the wall between um, their role as person in the bleacher and talking to our coach. I wasn't aware of any player on our, our roster doing that, but I've heard from a number of different sources that that is getting crossed more and more coaches getting emails from parents about their kids playing time, about all, the, all these different things. So is that happening? And not necessarily your program, but do you hear about it? And then what is the role of mom and dad when a kid goes away to college? Sure. So I'm not sure that I would hear about it if it's happening at other schools. Like, I'm not sure if that would kind of come onto my radar. So I can't, I can't give a, a blanket statement. I could tell you okay. it, it hasn't changed at UMBC. You know, we, we for, for one thing, we've been really fortunate with parents. Like, I just think we've, you know, we've had a lot of really great families come through our program and I've appreciated getting to know them. Anytime it's been a baseball conversation, it's been us and the player. You know, that definitely hasn't changed. There have been a few instances where something has happened in the player's personal life or maybe in the family's life away from baseball where, uh, you know, we would we want to know and we want to be able to support the player. And that's always OK. You know, yeah, for sure, obviously, for sure. if something were to happen, you know, it's not that um, we, we literally never want to hear from the parent. It's just anytime it's about baseball or school, essentially the player's responsibilities, he needs to take responsibility for that. And the guys have been good about that. Um, I think as far as a role for the parents, when they, uh, go off to college and, um, you know, I'm, I, 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 I maybe don't have as good a perspective on this as some people who have been through our program since my kids are so young, but the, the best I've seen it done is when, um, the, the, the family encourages to the, the young man to do just what I said, which is take responsibility. You know, I, I think any time a parent is, um, kind of making excuses or, or, or telling stories for, for a young player, they're just feeding into a negative cycle. And, and, and um, I just, I, I, I really, I, I've just been so fortunate to be around so many families that I think really supported their sons through, through playing college baseball and understood there would be some ups and downs and encouraged their, their sons to take responsibility for, for whatever was happening and, and deal with it rather than trying to explain it away and kind of, make things easier because then you're not going to get the real value for the experience. Gotcha. Bobby, what about you? Uh, I mean, on the youth side, the, the parents are always going to have a part. I mean, they're essentially, they're paying to play on the team. So they're going to, they're going to want their say for the most part though, we have awesome parents and I really try and lay it down in the beginning. Like, Hey, if your son, especially if he's a teenager or older, if he's got an issue, like he needs to come in, he needs to talk to, talk to whoever's either myself or whoever's coaches like that has to be 
the line of communication. I do not want the, the email asking why he got pulled out in the fifth inning and I, that those conversations aren't happening because they're not going to happen if your son wants to play in the next level. Uh, at least that's what I've been preaching. And I can say from my own experience that <laughs> oddly enough, my dad is actually as good of friends with all of my college coaches as probably I am. And it's not the meddling of it because he, he's the, the dad that would sit down the, the left field line and you wouldn't even see him because he'd be pacing back and forth during games. <laughs> but he was a high school coach for and he's coached, he's coached junior college baseball as well for since I, since I can remember before I even, you know, hit high school. And he like that relationship with my dad and those coaches is probably different than maybe a lot of parents. And I don't know, Liam, if you have that relationship with any former players, parents, uh, similar to that, but my dad is going to my former head coaches, uh, games still just to watch and hang out and talks to those guys. Like he's, it's just a different, it's, I have a unique, uh, you just know, a bottle, bottle of Malort. And... Yeah, just a bottle. Just a just. They go out drinking after the game, and you know, for beers and stuff. So it's it's totally different. And I I know he never said two words about me playing in college to those guys or anything like that because he was he would have been harder on me than they would be. But yeah, the the parents. It's on the youth level you see it a lot, and then the high school coaches. I feel bad for some of these guys that the stuff that they do have to kind of entertain because the job calls for that and if you go to a private school in Chicago some of these parents have a lot of pull and the you kind of of comes with the territory being a being the head coach but the college ranks you know you said it and I preach it a lot it's the the college coach does not want to hear from your parents nor does he care what they have to say because the roster is 35 guys and you're one of 35 and the it's just not, it's not how it's done. And maybe it's going to change in the future, but I haven't heard it changing currently at the college ranks. Well, yeah. And last thing here for Liam, but Liam, what is playing time like when you move on to college baseball? Because I think that's one of the things that parents can struggle with. And I remember having an email conversation with, with, with a dad as his son was in a, a division one program. His son didn't play for me. I, I know him. He, I work with him remotely, but he, he emailed me frustrated that his kid wasn't, the team wasn't playing well. And there were opportunities, whether they're in blowouts or whatever, for his son to probably get some mop-up innings. Like it would make sense. Like everyone else is getting destroyed. Like you throw my kid in and let him get destroyed too. Like get guys feet wet. Um, and I, I was like, you know what? I, I, I understand your perspective, but you just because you got a scholarship or you got a little money or you got a roster spot, your son doesn't, he's not owed one second of playing time in college baseball. Now, obviously you wouldn't want to recruit a kid that you wouldn't plan on giving a second of playing time. Like that doesn't make sense either, but what do you, what, what should parents understand about playing time and just how competitive it is in the college environment? Well, the, the first thing they should understand is that every practice is evaluated really, really closely. And that's what I think is missed in a lot of this is, you know, people think that, Oh, because a, a, a player isn't getting an opportunity in games at, in his favorite role, he's not getting a true chance to perform. That kid has an opportunity to perform every day in practice. I promise you, good point. all really of us point. coaches, if, if, if somebody comes in and blows the rest of the team off the field in practice, we're going to run that guy out there in the game, particularly the team's struggling. The team's not playing very well. Yeah. Your, your best practice players are going to play. So the, the ambition should be to be the best practice player at that university. And if you're not the best practice player at that university, then, you know, that's where the, the, the focus and the development should, should be. It shouldn't be, you know, I'm on the roster. Other people are performing. I should get my chance to not perform. It should be, well, what do I need to do to make it crystal clear that I'm the, I'm the best guy at every practice? Cause that guy always gets a chance. I've never been a part of a team where a guy who is is just a, a dominant practice player doesn't play in the games. Yeah, that's a great answer. A really yeah. good answer. And it's definitely, I have yet to hear of a situation where I interpreted it as being personal with playing time. It's oh. coaches get, to, if you give the guy, if you give that coach the best chance to win, he's, he's going to give you some kind of opportunity. It's not personal. If it, if you come to me and the first thing you say, it, it is personal. I, I'm going to look at you like you've got three heads. Like it's just not personal 
And if you feel like it is personal and that's, you can't get that out of your mind, you're at the wrong, you're in the wrong situation for yourself, but it's not personal. And it really, it needs some self-reflecting before you start, you know, projecting it onto the, you know, the coach has an issue with me because I'm whatever. It's not, it's not, you're wrong. And I, I just, <laughs> you know, especially at the college ranks, I just, I just think you're wrong. And that's my, that's where I fall on it. Yeah. It, well, it, yeah, no, I, I would just real quick to kind of put a bow on it. Like, um, you know, if you're, if you're a pitcher and you're, you're, you're just executing the heck out of it in the bullpen, like for most college teams, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 guys get in the game over any given season. If, if you're doing a great job in your side work, you're doing a great job in scrimmages, you're going to get those opportunities in the game. And if you don't make the most of those opportunities, to me, it's on you as a player, you know, some guys get a bigger window of opportunity than others um, just because of the way the chips fall. But the key is to be ready for your opportunity and to, to never let it go when you, when you get it. And I, I, I just think where parents can underserve their, their uh, sons is by trying to create um, kind of an off ramp from, from that uh, type of pressure. I think to be any kind of performer in what we do, you need to embrace that. Um, and, and really enjoy the challenge of having to perform when called upon. Yeah, absolutely. So Liam, this is your chance. Um, pitch us on UMBC or, or what would you like people to know about your program? I'm sure everyone who's still listening to this point has been as impressed with the conversation as I am. So I think people listening know that if you were to end up playing for coach Bowen, super fair guy is going to work with you and, and give you every chance to succeed and compete for a spot on the field. So what, what would you like people to know about, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, go Retrievers. Um, oh, yeah, for, for sure. It's, and I appreciate the opportunity. It's a, it's a phenomenal university. I mean, I think uh, people certainly in, in our area, in our part of the country, are very familiar with it. People in uh, certain fields or they're, where they're hiring young people are really familiar with it. And what I would say to any of your listeners is if they're not familiar with it, I say this to all of our recruits, just Google it for five minutes. You know, like, like the, the, the way – uh, the school's been able to grow and the attention that it's gotten academically, I think really speaks for itself. So uh, what, I, if I had to describe our university quickly, it would, and our, and our, our program, the way it fits within it quickly, it would be, we're one of the few places in the country that really combine true high-end academics with really good mid-major baseball. We play in a great league and um, I've been fortunate to, to be part of championship teams in our league. And um, we're going to, we're going to be back there, uh, just through doing things the way that uh, I've kind of been talking about in, in the podcast so far as, uh, you know, leading with our values and putting a team on the field that our university can be proud of because that's what it deserves. It's a really great place. Okay. And you guys are uh, really strong in a lot of the sciences, right? Computer science. And what are some of the other? Sure. Anything in the STEM fields, we're, we're, we're really good. I mean, we're competitive on a national level. The school's grown to the point where, um, you know, even uh, history majors like myself can can certainly find a home at UMBC. And, and I think we're strong across the board. But the way that we grew and got a lot of positive attention academically has definitely been through science, technology, engineering, math, econ, stuff like that. OK, so people can find you where on the Web or how would you if they want to contact you or follow you guys on Twitter, Instagram? What are your uh, how can they how can they do that? Uh, at UMBC Baseball on Twitter, we encourage anybody who's interested in our program to follow us there. It's a, a good way to get news about our program. Our social media guys do a really good job. And it's also where we announce any camps. So I, I talked a couple of times about the importance of camps in the recruiting process. Um, uh, hopefully we can start running them relatively soon. That's something that's obviously uh, with the health situation uh, on hold, but it's an important part of recruiting at our school and, and other places. So following on Twitter is a good way to hear about that. Have you seen that bubble soccer where you're like in those big bubbles and just like your legs are sticking out? You could do that for a baseball camp. You know, I, I don't UBC think we're going to pursue camp. that option, Dan. <laughs> I think we're just going to wait until we can can fire it off Fine. In, in, Fine. In, the, uh, in the standard uh, way. But um, uh, hopefully it doesn't come to that, man. You know, I, I know we're all eager to get back out on the field. Yeah. Well, Liam, thanks so much. It was a great conversation. I think today was superb. So appreciate you being here with us. Sure, sure. Yeah, it was a fun way to spend the morning with you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. And if you're out there listening, thank you so much. Um, we're on Spotify, iTunes, obviously video here on uh, Twitter and YouTube live uh, replays are on Twitter and YouTube as well. So thanks for being here. Bobby Stevens, take us out. Liam, that was awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll see everybody Friday. All right. Take care.